Okay, guys, it's time to start talking about the nature of science. Uh, you should have already read William McComas's article in The Science Teacher uh, on the keys to teaching nature of science. And today we're going to explain that uh, in more detail and come up with some examples uh, of that uh, information as well. So again, just to review the nine attributes of the nature of science. Uh, the first one is that science relies on empirical evidence. The second one is the knowledge production in science includes many common features and shared habits of mind. However, in spite of those such commonalities, there's no single step-by-step -step scientific method by which all science is done. And that's a, that's a pretty big one uh, to really address with students. Number three, scientific knowledge is tentative but durable. Four, laws and theories are related but distinct kinds of scientific knowledge. Five, science is a highly creative endeavor. Six, science has a subjective element. Seven, there are historical, cultural, and social influences on science. Eight, science and technology impact each other but are not the same. And nine, science and its methods cannot answer all questions. So these are the nine uh, attributes of the nature of science or what refer to as the keys of nature science. And so we're gonna go through each of these. And so the first one, of course, is science demands and relies on empirical evidence. And so the, the article really addresses uh, the meaning of this and by, by saying that faith alone in the correctness of one's views plays no final role in science. Science must have observational evidence uh, to construct theories out of before those theories become acceptable to scientists. And so uh, polar vortex has been a particular uh, topic that people have been discussing lately. And so providing evidence for the polar vortex theory is really the task at hand, uh, especially for, for those that are working in climate science and are trying to uh, mitigate climate change. Let's start by watching this little video to help you get familiarized with the polar vortex. This is Antarctica. It is so cold that my snot froze. I just got home to the States and it's actually colder here than it was there. And I'm not even in Chicago. The coldest air in decades. Whiteout conditions. 20 to 40 degrees lower than normal. So what on earth is going on? I mean, like, literally, what the heck is our planet up to? If the planet's supposed to be warming, why is it so cold? Polar, polar vortex. Deadly polar vortex. vortex. Polar vortex. This polar vortex has dominated the news headlines for the last week, but there's a lot of confusion about what it actually is. To atmospheric scientists, the polar vortex refers to these high altitude stratospheric winds that are spinning really fast up near the North Pole. They trap a pool of super cold air over the Arctic. Sometimes it splits in two, and that forces colder air south. But this polar vortex has become, well, polarizing. It's counterintuitive. If our planet is warming, then why is it so cold outside? The trend even this year with our cold this year, this winter is still among the warmest ever. It's not negating global warming. There are really only two areas on the whole globe that are colder than normal right now. Everywhere else for the most part is warmer than normal. Just because a particular weather event bucks the trend, doesn't mean that the planet on average isn't warming as a whole. And in fact, some scientists are starting to argue that this polar plunge is caused by climate change. Here's the thinking. As the planet warms, the poles are warming a lot faster than the mid-latitudes, so places like the US. So the difference in temperature, or gradient, between the North Pole and, say, the Midwest is much less extreme than it used to be. That causes the polar vortex to weaken. And this makes our jet stream, which is at a lower altitude than the polar vortex, weaker and wavier. And that drives our weather in the United States. But this is still a hotly debated hypothesis. I think that the jump between saying that by slackening that temperature contrast from the um, mid-latitudes to the pole, that doesn't necessarily mean the jet stream is going to become wavier. It's certainly played out this year, just like the hypothesis says, and last year too. It looks like it's global warming, but I don't think anyone yet has enough data to nail that to the ground. 
One thing is clear. The scientific community agrees that despite the Antarctic temperatures in the Midwest this week, the globe on average is still warming. But if you are in one of those places that's experiencing record cold, try to stay warm. And check out some of the links in the description for more on the science of the Arctic vortex and how to survive the Antarctic cold. Okay, so you saw at the end of that video how they uh, had the actual scientists talking about uh, this hypothesis and how they need more evidence uh, to actually build this theory into something that's acceptable. And so uh, in referring back to the article uh, by McComas, uh, some ideas in science just start as exploratory notions. And so we need observations to confirm our predictions. And so we're hearing a lot of predictions in the media about uh, what's happening and why those Arctic plunges that I'm sure many of you that uh, live in the northern part of the country have experienced at some point in time uh, in the last five years. You probably remember if you were teaching at the time not having school for a month or two because of the arctically cold uh, temperatures that persisted. And so uh, to confirm the predictions on those exploratory notions, we need to have observations and and observations can take three different forms for scientists. They can be collected through experimental methods where they get actual data, and then that data uh, is used to kind of confirm or deny something that was originally a prediction. Uh, historical methods, and then also observational methods. And so in terms of the polar vortex, you know, we, we, we really want data, we want measurements, photographs, all of this uh, compiled together creates the evidence that we need uh, to make this theory more accepted. And so they talked about uh, in the video how global warming is likely uh, causing the, the temperature gradient between the Arctic regions and the mid-latitude regions to not be as strong of a difference in temperature. And so, that's causing the stratospheric polar vortex uh, some, some issues because this, the strength of this vortex relies on it being much colder than other temperatures. And so as the, the sea ice melts and the ocean water being less reflective of light will absorb more of that energy and get warmer, the North Pole is going to warm at a faster rate and it's going to really cause the, the stratospheric polar vortex to lose that temper, temperature gradient that it needs to remain strong. And so you can see in uh, these models that were created by the GOES-5 satellite, which is a NASA satellite, uh, it records stratospheric temperature. And you can see how uh, the stratosphere air masses kind of separate based upon their temperature. and that. Uh, model will actually align with the air temperature recordings that we have uh, affecting lower in the atmosphere down in the troposphere. And so this is great. This is a step towards evidence. This is observational evidence connecting a link between stratospheric temperatures and then the temperatures that we experience uh, closer to the surface of the earth and those behaviors and how they are similar to one another. Okay, and so that's that's really our first type of, uh, of evidence there, the observational method. Now, also Kretschmer et al., uh, they actually did a study. So uh, kind of taking some historical recounts of, of information. So this is a historical method of collecting evidence where they clustered uh, this hierarchy together to show an increase in weak vortex states during January and February over the last 37 years. And so uh, just wanted you to pay extra attention to some verbiage that's used by people in that video. And so they say when the temperature difference is not as stark, some scientists believe that the winds weaken and break continuity. And so it's it's this, it's this clause here 
that really is what the evidence uh, is needed for. And so we really need to find a link between the temperature difference and these behaviors. And so that's still not something that's been observed uh, directly to know if rising temperatures and of, of the globe and that decrease in the temperature gradient is what's causing the, the erratic behavior. It could just be a regular weather phenomenon. And so really we need more evidence to state uh, this claim that uh, the polar vortex splitting and causing the jet streams to kink and weaken and allow Arctic air to move further south is a result of global warming. Okay, let's move on to number two. Uh, attribute number two is all about that that there's no step-by-step -step scientific method. And this is a big one, especially for elementary uh, teachers, because when you're teaching your students how to become a scientist, oftentimes in textbooks, you're presented with the scientific method, which yes, is a very good, reliable way to go about solving problems uh, in participating in science, but it's not the only way. And oftentimes it's not how science is actually done by scientists. And so it's really important that you don't get your students in this misconception that the scientific method is the only way that you can engage in science processes and the collection of information for scientific knowledge. And so uh, according to McComas, such a stepwise method commonly provided in science textbooks may be effective as a research tool. Okay, and so again, this is not a universal required set of steps in order to perform science. And so uh, just some examples here. An observation of abnormally cold air temperatures uh, it really was a problem for people in the United States and also uh, over top of the USSR. Uh, and so that, that, that experience and that observation actually is what led to uh, the interest in doing research. And so air temperature data uh, leads to research of historical weakenings. And then no experiment has actually been performed, yet there has actually been a conclusion of observational historical data. And so based upon the observational and historical data that exists. And so you can see how we would take a jump from research uh, all the way down to data and conclusion and constructing hypotheses, right? So these are not, these are not in the same exact order in which they're presented. And so now we've got a question that's being refined from, from the observations and the historical data instead of an experimental uh, procedure that's taking place. And so it's kind of hard to actually perform an experiment on the atmosphere to test this because of the large scale experiment that would be required in order to confirm that. So we almost have to wait and, and observe it as part of the experiment. And so this experimental phase really doesn't exist. Uh, now, creative science will come up with ways to model and do some modeled experiments uh, on this information. But uh, the key here that I want you to see is that it doesn't follow this step-by-step -step sequence all the time. And it's important that we don't let our students believe that they must follow the scientific method when they're creating their science fair project or whenever they're trying to do science on their own. Okay, and so now moving on to number three is scientific knowledge is tentative, meaning that it can change, but it's usually durable. And the reason that it's durable is because scientific knowledge that is accepted is accepted because it has compelling evidence to support it. And that's what makes it durable. And so it's really important here to keep in mind that science and the way that we go about collecting this information uh, is a process to generate scientific knowledge. It's not out to actually prove anything. It's out to understand the processes that are happening around us. And there are some things that are happening that are with be beyond human uh, capability to actually do an experiment on and test to prove anything. And so uh, scientific conclusions are valuable and long lasting because of the way that knowledge eventually comes to be accepted through that peer review process through multiple iterations of maybe the scientific method uh, and all the different ways that you can do research on, on the content. And so uh, that also for students would mean that different scientists working in different 
fields of science contributing to the same topic, right? So maybe a geologist having something to say about climate change uh, would actually be a way uh, for science to participate in a checks and balance system. So we don't just want one particular scientist providing all the information. So we, we really rely on different people and their different experiences to help us with that uh, process. And so Aristotle, uh, for example, thought of the earth existing forever. Uh, and so his, his philosophy really started off this idea of the atom, right? And so, or uh, the earth, it, the earth's existence. And so Lucretius could only observe records beyond the Trojan War. So uh, when we think about how old the earth was, where Aristotle think that it was indefinitely forever, uh, people started thinking about ways to prove that. And so uh, here's an observation of we could only go back to the Trojan War. And so the earth in, to Lucretus was a relatively young earth. And then biblical accounts, another historical observation. Uh, led James Usher to believe that Earth began 4004 BC. So we get a more exact time frame uh, identified there. And then this process continues. In, this, in 1660s, Nicholas Steno developed concepts of strata deposition and how all those different strata contain different fossils. And so understanding this process of how layers of strata build on top of other layers of strata uh, led to the principle of of uh, uni or sorry, not uniformitarianism, but this principle of uh, horizontal layering that occurs. And so that the, the bottom layer in a rock strata would indicate the first formed rock layer and the oldest. And so identifying those fossils within those different layers helped people piece together a better history of the earth and could get closer to how old the earth actually was. And so Robert Hooke suggested that the chronology of the fossil records in these layers suggested that the earth was even older than what was previously known. Okay, and so we can move further with James Hutton, who uh, in the 18th century benefited from a lot of uh, canal building that was taking place across the globe. And so that allowed for geologists to go to these different places that were being cut into to actually look at the, the strata in those different locations. And so he actually come up with the idea of unconformities, which were uh, whenever you had erosional surfaces that would remove existing rock layers and then other rock layers would be deposited on top of them, which would basically mean like the strata would change or that there were pieces of, of the rock uh, history that were that were not there, there was no evidence of it, which to him would imply then that there was missing time and possibly meaning that the earth was older than it uh, was seen at the time. And so in 1788, he constructed the idea of uniformitarianism. And so uh, this is the natural, this is the thought that natural processes that we witness taking place currently on the earth in terms of deposition and uplifting uh, through the rock cycle were actually happening the same exact way uh, previously in historical times. And so we can use that information to help us come up with a better understanding of the, the age of the earth. And there was a slight problem to that, but we'll get to that in a bit. And so he also is uh, famous for this quote, the present is the key to the past. And that, that's an extension to the, the meaning of the uniformitarianism idea. And so those natural processes that we see are uniform, meaning that they occurred a long time ago. So that could be referring to subduction zones. So plate interactions that we see today happened in Earth's past and occurred at the same rate. And that was actually the big problem with uniformitarianism when people started using this principle to figure out the age of the Earth because they didn't take in account for some of these depositional features that couldn't have been happening at the same rate uh, for example, the ocean, uh, the salt level in the oceans were probably different uh, in, in early Earth. And so that led to the, the rates of deposition of the rock layers beneath the ocean happening at different rates. Right? If there's less, less salt, then you're going to get less sediment. And so that rock layer is going to form slower, perhaps, than if there were more salt and more sediment deposition taking place, which the ocean is rather salty now. And so 
we could assume that those rates were different, which was something they overlooked a lot uh, when they were figuring this out. And so here's an example of a scientist outside of the realm of geology trying to contribute to uh, this calculation of the age of the earth. And so William Thompson, uh, who is termed Lord Kelvin in 1892, uh, he was a, a physicist who formulated the law of thermodynamics. And so he had a lot of points here that relied on heat exchange and thermodynamics as his evidence for supporting the age of the earth. And so he argued that heat generated by the formation of earth was lost over time and that you could use the rate of heat loss and the solidification of the crust to calculate a more accurate age of the earth. Uh, the second thing that he threw out was that uh, were some comments on the bulging of Earth's equator. And so he thought that the Earth-Moon system, which likely caused the bulging of the Earth at the equatorial region as the moon orbit around, around the Earth, the gravity interactions between the two would, would cause that deformation to take place. And so that could be used as evidence. And then he also thought that the sun has a heat exchange that also takes place, not just the Earth. And so he, he considered the rate of the sun uh, heat lost uh, to the total amount of heat that it originally contained to come up with uh, a time in which uh, the earth could have possibly had formed. And so most scientists that looked at this instantly denied his second clause, right? He was saying that uh, this was kind of outside the, the actual scope of what they were trying to do and that uh, it was it was not really gonna provide any useful information. But radioactive decay was also seen as something that hurt point number one that he tried to make. And that's, there are elements in the Earth's crust and interior that are radioactive. And so they generate their own heat through the natural radioactive decay process, which would put error in measurements. And without really having a way to determine how much heat was released, uh, this wasn't going to be a viable option at the time for them to calculate the age of the Earth. And then in 1919, Harlow Shapley commented on uh, the fact that there was really no known source behind the sun's energy. They didn't know uh, how it gave off its heat. And so that one was actually quickly uh, commented on in 1920 by Arthur Eddington, who uh, decided that it was the fusion process, nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium that generated the sun's energy and caused the sun to radiate heat outward from it. Uh, and so the thought behind that was that if the sun was a burning ball of fire, it, it would actually chemically react through a combustion reaction much faster than uh, what we had observed. And so that, that, that would uh, provide evidence for that the sun's not a burning ball of fire to these folks. And so Arthur Reddington then had to come up with an explanation for uh, the sun's existence being as long as it was. And so uh, things were still unknown, right? And so in the 19th century, the number was thrown out after all this information was considered that the earth was at least 100 million years old um, based upon the measured inputs that they had. But again, remember, they didn't consider the outputs. They didn't think about the, those rates of weathering. Uh, the rates of erosion, the rates of deposition being uh, different. And so uh, also radioactivity was poorly understood. And so it wasn't until 1926 that radiometric dating uh, actually was known enough that they created a time scale for the three major decay chains that occurred with the earth materials. And so Based upon that information, they ran calculations and got 4.55 billion years old, which is pretty close uh, to the current time. In fact, you could argue it's the same time uh, astronomically that, that we have for the age of the Earth now. All right? And so then there was this thought that uh, also that our Earth was formed at the same time as all the other planets in our solar system and through the same process in which our sun formed about four and a half billion years ago. So that, that's known as the solar nebular hypothesis. And so uh, this is just a schematic from NASA's space place that you can access with some other activities 
to use with your students if you're wanting to teach this timeline of events uh, for your astronomy content. But so it goes with uh, a cloud of hydrogen gas and dust that began rotating due to some type of energy input. Maybe a nearby supernova explosion provided enough energy for this cloud to start rotating. Uh, really the source of rotation is unknown, but as, as it rotated, it would uh, then kind of flatten into a disc while it's rotating, kind of like a ball of pizza dough and you, if you were spinning it with your hands, how uh, it would start flattening into a disc and then enough heat and pressure in the center due to gravity bringing materials towards the center of this rotating disc provided the energy for a protostar where it wasn't quite hot enough yet for hydrogen to be converted into helium through nuclear fusion but still warm enough to to start giving off some light and then once nuclear fusion took place uh, then you have a true star in the center of of this uh, solar system that was forming and so likely that that star being generated gave off a shockwave of energy, which helped divide the, the, the protoplanetary disk into its different densities. So that's why we, we believe we, that's one reason we believe that we see the more dense rocky planets closer to the sun and the lighter gassier planets further away from the sun. And now at, through time, these larger center of masses that were rotating around the, the center of the solar system uh, started uh, collecting, or we would say accreting, the material into these planets, into the solar system that we know presently, which we believe is still forming in ways. Uh, and so that's evidence through meteorites and things that are still, you know, colliding with other planets. And it's just, uh, much more mature than it originally was. So when we think about the age of the sun then, using the solar nebula hypothesis, that would indicate that objects in our solar system formed at about the same time. So the sun likely formed about 4.5 billion years ago, 4.6 billion years ago as well. And when we get some of those meteorite samples and do the radiometric dating on them, we get ages of about 4.5 billion years, which is another piece of evidence to support not only the solar nebula hypothesis, but also the age of the earth, the current idea behind it. So the purpose of this timeline was to show you how scientific knowledge changes, right? We go back to our slide on number three, it's tentative. So it's durable because of all of the evidence that is put into creating the best possible explanation at the time, but we also recognize as scientists that our current ideas could change with you know, the existence of new evidence that could change our existing thoughts. Okay, let's move on to number four now. Number four is that there is a distinct difference between a scientific law and a scientific theory. In our next hour, uh, we're actually going to demonstrate this one more clearly, but I'll just give you a little taste now. And so the big thing here with number four is to that students often have this misconception that scientific theories become scientific laws, right? And that a scientific law is more believable than a scientific theory. And that's actually very far from the truth. Scientific laws never stem from scientific theories, right? Scientific theories can never become a scientific law. They are completely separate types of scientific knowledge. And so what are scientific laws? Scientific laws are generalizations or patterns that we see happening in nature all the time. Whereas scientific theories are explanations for why those things that we see happen, okay? And so just one particular example here, for a scientific law, we've got Coulomb's law, right? That's the, that's the law that calculates the electrostatic force between two charged objects. And so it's based upon their distance away from one another, the charge of each of those objects, and uh, Coulomb's constant is involved as well. And so when we take a certain amount of charge and put them at a certain amount of distance, we can measure uh, the force between, between them, right? And we can... This is something that's repeated all the time, and it happens everywhere in our universe. It's not something we need to explain. It's something that happens without a doubt. We observe it. And so to explain that, we have constructed this idea of electric fields, right? We don't 
We've never actually seen an electric field with our eyes to know that they exist. We don't have any data to support, uh, well, we don't have any data that really maps it out like, I've sh like I'm showing you in this picture. This is, a, this is an illustration based off of our explanation for electric fields. And so uh, electric fields are seen as a strangeness coming out of a charge where the charge either exhibits a pushing force or a negative or a, a, a pulling force towards it based upon its charge, right? And so when, you, with your, with, when you're within that electric field, you're gonna, if you are an electrically charged particle, you're gonna respond to that field. You're either gonna be tugged into something or you're gonna to wanna to be pushed away from something because your electric fields are interacting with one another. So we, again, we don't witness electric fields. We don't see them. We just infer that they exist based upon our, our observations of them. And, and so this is our explanation of Coulomb's law. And we're gonna get more in depth with that later. Okay, number five is science is a highly creative endeavor. And so, I mean, you could probably already imagine the person that come, uh, comes to the conclusion that electric fields are these influence of charge around charged particles and that they can pull in if they're negative and push out if they're positive. And if a positive and a negative come together, they, they would agree with one another and attract. That's a rather creative thing, right? You don't see that really happening with your own eyes. You have to come up with uh, something based upon the experimental evidence, the historical evidence, and the observational evidence that you have available to you. And so many students think that there's no room for them in science because they see themselves as an artistic or creative person. And so I, I actually extremely disagree with that fact because we oftentimes need artistic people to help us generate our models that we have to, to communicate science with one another, to explain what an electric field is. We need somebody who can can turn someone else's idea into an image or into a model that can be used for communication. And so the process of designing an experiment is not only creative, uh, the process of communicating it is creative. And so what do I mean though about the designing an experiment? How is that creative? Well, when you think about Michael Faraday who actually had to come up with an experiment to kind of prove uh, his his thoughts or to provide, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I should never say to approve his thoughts because science cannot prove anything, right? So to find evidence for his theory, uh, he's got to come up with a very interesting way to actually experiment with charged particles. And so that takes creativity. And so, uh, Another example of this would be using seismic waves to sense uh, an underground volcano beneath the underground uh, beneath Yellowstone volcano, right? So I'm going to show you this uh, particular website. This is where you can read more about this if you're interested. But uh, seismic waves, they travel slower through hotter molten rock and faster through colder, less dense rocks. So just like how we use seismic waves to locate the epicenter of a of an earthquake, we can use seismic waves to help us infer what inside the earth is molten, what inside the earth is solid. And so uh, this is a very creative approach to understanding what's underneath the earth. And so uh, using that information and those different speeds of seismic waves that are detected, uh, we can create these images of what we think is happening beneath the Yellowstone caldera. So there's actually two large, uh, partial melt, a basaltic partial melt and a rhyolitic partial melt uh, that exists based upon those observations from the seismic data. Okay, so number six, science has a subjective element. And so science is a human activity. And so with that in mind, uh, humans aren't perfect, right? Humans make mistakes all the time. In fact, in just a simple measurement, two people can see two different readings on a thermometer. If it's you know an, an alcohol-based thermometer, you're looking at the little red line. Uh, depending on how tall you are and where your eye is positioned, uh, when you're trying to read that, you're going to get two different readings. And so you can also look at the results of an experiment or the results of of even just a study and get two different opinions based upon uh, the information that's in front of you. And so one particular example of this is. Uh, 
whenever 70 research teams that were spread out all across the globe, they were independent from one another, they analyzed brain scans, and they each went about uh, analyzing the brain scans through a different procedure. And so due to their different analysis techniques, uh, they actually got very extremely variable results upon uh, what those brain scans meant uh, in patients. And so uh, you could you could you could see easily why we peer review things and why we have discussions in science because uh, that helps us get closer to more accurate conclusions. Okay, number seven is historical, cultural, and social influences uh, the science, uh, the world of science. And so uh, this one is very true. I've got a lot of videos here that explain that will explain this. Uh, there's an expense in performing science, keep that in mind. And so anytime that there's the request for money uh, from an, a group of scientists that are, you know, trying to write a grant, for example, they have to, they have to persuade the, the people that are providing them with the money that their scientific work is valuable to, to society uh, is one particular example. And so uh, with that in mind, because there are, there's a cost involved with performing science, scientists should study practical topics, things that actually are going to affect uh, people. And so some research is encouraged and discouraged because of pressures in society. Right? And those could be history, religion, or social priorities. Uh, and so, you know, with one of these videos we're going to watch here are on the ethical questions behind stem cell research. Uh, and, and so all of that uh, could influence what types of science are done because as a constituent or a voter, you know, you're going to vote a particular politician that has a platform behind maybe doing certain types of scientific research that they're going to encourage. Uh, maybe you want a, a person that's going to do research on alternative energy sources uh, and fund people to do that and to build those infrastructures uh, to improve our capacity for alternative energies. Uh, and so all, you actually, even if you're not a scientist, this is something I want to relate to my students is that if you never become a scientist, you need to understand science because as a voter in the United States, you're going to make decisions about what science is funded and what science isn't funded. And so you need to know that. All right, let's watch uh, these videos. Got one here on Yellowstone. Recently, scientists have collected new data, giving them a better picture of Yellowstone's underground plumbing. Right beneath the caldera from the last eruption sits the magma chamber. And it's fed by a plume of magma stretching down 465 miles northwest into Montana. It's mostly solid rock with the potential to liquefy. And scientists are closely monitoring it. Magma, or molten rock, is rising through the plume into the magma chamber at two inches a year. There's no reason for it to stop, although it might come in spurts. Our images show wider parts and narrower parts, so it's like slugs of material that are flowing in a sewer line. And this restless Yellowstone caldera is truly living, breathing, and every once in a while it burps. The danger is if the plume starts liquefying and moving up at a faster rate. Natural systems uh, can can throw us a lot of curveballs. A lot of things can happen that we're not really ready for. Scientist Jake Lowenstern is looking for a pattern connecting the supervolcano today and its three prior major eruptions. 2.1 million years ago, 1.3 million years ago, and 640,000 years ago. In two of the really large eruptions at Yellowstone, so much material comes out, entire mountain ranges end up falling into the ground and essentially disappearing. One 50-mile stretch of mountains simply disappeared by collapsing into the magma chamber. University of Toronto geologist John Westgate has tracked the ash from Yellowstone's prior eruptions. It covered much of the United States. It occurs right out of the Pacific Ocean. 
is even found in the Gulf of Mexico. Up in northeast Montana, there's a site that we're working on. The temperature is over seven meters thick. These eruptions are enormous. The amount of material erupted from them, huge. When Mount St. Helens erupted in May 1980, it blew off one side of the mountain and triggered an avalanche of snow, mud, ash, and rock. Driven by the wind, the ash landed in 11 states and up into Canada. But that's nothing compared to the amount of ash from Yellowstone's last three major eruptions. In magnitude and volume, each one was far greater than Mount St. Helens. Today, there's little evidence of the supervolcano's violent past. The 50 by 30 mile caldera from the last eruption was covered by lava and ash and smoothed over by glaciers. Forests now conceal the scars. So that was a really good example of how history can influence science that is performed. And of course, uh, this one will mean something to you all now. You, you'll understand the social influence on science based upon this information. Here at Scripps Research, we're working on three different tracks. We're focusing on drugs that can uh, use, be used to treat uh, the infection, and we're using the enormous resources of Scripps and its deep expertise in drug screening, drug development, to make compounds that would help treat an established infection. We're using our knowledge of the virus to develop antibodies and other kinds of biologics that healthcare workers could use to protect from an infection. These would last for 40 days after a single administration. And then we're developing vaccines. And our goal here is to be able to identify which parts of the virus are most important for the immune system to target and to develop vaccines that focus on those regions of the, of the virus. The first goal in the vaccine field is to understand what the best way to target the virus is. So uh, on the surface of the virus is a protein, it's called the S protein or the spike protein. It is the only piece of the virus that your immune system sees. And we want to make sure that your immune system focuses on those parts of that protein that are most useful and least likely to be harmful uh, in a vaccine formulation. Our second problem is with biologics. And here we know how to make good antibodies and good biologics, but we need to ensure that they live for a good amount of time in your body. And the reason that's important is we need to have something that you can inject once and it would protect uh, a doctor or a healthcare worker um, uh, from infection uh, and not require repeated injections. The, the key viral steps in the life cycle that we're targeting are number one, the entry process, the, the manner in which the virus latches onto the cell. Number two, we are targeting two proteases uh, that are essential for the virus to make the proteins it needs to replicate. And um, we are then also targeting uh, structures, uh, RNA structures that uh, the virus forms and needs to replicate. So if you can blockade any of those steps, you can stop the virus from replicating. An enormous spirit of collaboration and hard work and just goodwill uh, across the campus and, and actually ac across uh, science in general internationally. There are about 100 people now working at Scripps Research on the coronavirus. Uh, this ranges from 
individuals who are biologists, experts in coronavirology, to people who work on the development of small, small molecules, uh, uh, to uh, individuals in our veterinary staff, to our histologists, our cores, there's 500 labs, 500 groups of uh, across the world that are roughly doing the same thing. Um, and the point is now we are sharing data and working together and pushing this thing as fast and as hard as we possibly can. Yeah, I hate to end the video there on you short. You can go back into the presentation and watch the rest if you want. But that thing that he just said was the most important thing that I, I wanted you to see in this video is that uh so many organizations just kind of stopped what they were doing right because of these social priorities that we have uh now and so those those labs are working on those things okay uh and then we've got uh our uh in our religion influence now to talk about so i'm going to play part of this video i may not play it all and i'm going to play part of this i'm going to play it all because i don't want to keep this video too long. But again, you can always go back into the presentation from the classroom and, and obtain the videos to watch them. So that was just kind of a brief explanation of human embryonic stem cells uh, ther therapeutic cloning uh, through therapeutic cloning. Just so you have an idea uh, going into this, if you didn't already know, uh, because this, this gentleman is going to talk a lot about the ethical questions behind doing stem cells. What's the right thing to do? What's the appropriate way about going about this? Does this question have an answer? Over the last several years, stem cell research has been associated with a lot of enthusiasm, but it's also been associated with a lot of ethical issues. Recently, we've seen a lot of attention and a lot of scientific excitement over IPS, or induced pluripotent stem cell research. This is very exciting science. You can take a skin cell, like a cheek swab, uh, or you know, medical waste from a procedure, and take those cells, give them a little sort of fountain of youth cocktail and turn them into something that is like embryonic stem cells that, that can turn into, that is pluripotent, that can turn into any cell in the human body. Science by its nature moves very quickly and unpredictably and generally out of the public spotlight. So it's generally not until after the science, the initial science has already been produced and published that policymakers or the general public hear about it. When President Obama uh, issued his executive order uh, rescinding the Bush uh, administration order, he directed the National Institutes of Health to develop guidelines for federal funding of embryonic stem cell research. And it's dramatically increased the amount of stem cell research that can actually be funded in the US. So the National Academies guidelines, which were the first set of guidelines out there at all in the United States for governing stem cell research, arose out of the interests of scientists who understood very clearly that this was a socially controversial area of science. And in the absence of any federal regulation, went to the National Academies and said, you know, please develop guidance, develop a, a system under which we can operate so that we are accountable and so that we prevent you know, bad outcomes. Scientists you know, go into science to do science, not to do law. So we developed a, a 
project are looking at international collaboration in stem cell research in the context of this highly varied landscape of, of policies governing stem cell research. And this turned out to be the beginning of what we now call the Hingston Group, which is an international consortium of scientists, ethicists, policymakers, lawyers, philosophers who are interested in, as I said before, fostering ethically and scientifically defensible research. Some of the most heated ethical controversies related to embryonic stem cell research have related to the fact that embryos need to be destroyed in order to create embryonic stem cell lines. Professional groups were coming into the picture saying, we know that there are ethical issues involved. We know that there are different laws locally, nationally, and internationally. And they wanted to provide scientists with a way of negotiating among these different laws and, and ethical norms. Under the National Academy of Sciences, this is known as an escrow, nothing to do with the mortgage crisis, but the Embryonic Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee. For the ISSCR, the International Society of Stem Cell Research, they recommend a SCRO, a Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee, because they took on the larger task of not just looking at the ethical issues with embryonic stem cell research, but those of all sorts of stem cells. At Hopkins, we obviously took notice of these major national and international guidelines, assembled a committee of people from across the university, given that we do a considerable amount of stem cell research, and made a decision to proceed with establishing an escrow here at Johns Hopkins. We constructed a multi multidisciplinary committee. It includes scientists, includes ethicists, attorneys, and non-institutional members so that we have relevant expertise in the room to consider the range of issues that are associated with stem cell research. If a scientist at Johns Hopkins wants to do research involving human embryonic stem cells, either research directed at deriving new human embryonic stem cell lines or doing laboratory work involving existing human embryonic stem cell lines, then she or he has to come to the escrow for approval for that research. What um, bioethicists and, and folks like myself who are scientists who are now doing work in ethics and policy try to do is to get ahead of that curve a bit. So to try to forecast by speaking with scientists and working with scientists, try to identify what are those issues that are coming down the pike scientifically that are going to be of interest and potentially of concern to the general public and to policymakers and to try to be proactive about developing guidance for how policymakers and the public might regard or regulate or oversee um, emerging technologies. Being in the field of bioethics is fantastic. We get to take the hardest questions, the things that people talk about at the dinner table or at a cocktail party and really study them, really try to figure out what's the right thing to do, what's the appropriate way about going about this, does this question have an answer. Okay, so that was pretty interesting. Let's move on here and talk about Van Allen radiation belt. Uh, should they stay or should they go? Another question that needs to be answered. And so NASA uh, has found evidence for uh, these particular bands of radiation that are in like donut shapes around the earth due to uh, what they think is caused by solar particles entering the magnetic field and being trapped within it. And they've been detected. Uh, they have uh, influence some of the strategies for you know missions that were leaving earth like uh, the moon missions and they also are kind of there now while people are you know on the international space station orbiting the earth and so uh there are a lot of reasons scientifically why people would want them to be removed to improve the efficiency and uh to to make it safer as well for anybody that's doing science in space but also uh, there is that ethical question of, well, this is a natural process, right? This is something that's been happening. Uh, and so should humans actually interfere with this? Should we change this? Is this going to actually end up harming the earth? 
uh, if it's changed. And so uh, just another ethical dilemma there that you could consider. I'm going to skip the videos for now. And you can watch them if you want, but kind of want to get to the end here. So uh, key point here that I want to make about this uh, attribute of nature science that you should be making to your, your students, especially elementary age students, when they're, when they're so uh, influential about the things that they want to do when they grow up, right? You, you have a huge influence over their decisions and empowering them with with that self-fulfilling prophecy that they can do things. And so uh, the point is, is that we need a diverse group of scientists because diverse perspectives, as you witnessed in that last video, improve our ability to perform science, uh, number one, ethically, more ethically, uh, two, effectively, uh, three, maybe even creatively because of people's different strengths, four, uh, it could be more objectively done because we can have our different expertise levels that can be used for peer review and, and to improve our conclusions that we make on our observed phenomenon. And then number five, empathically, right? We, we do science also for each other. And so uh, the more perspectives that we have, the more empathic that we can be for other people. All right, so one assignment that you might do with your students is to have them draw a scientist. Just give them a blank sheet of paper and anything that they want to color with, draw with, and ask them to draw scientists. And I bet you that a majority of your students are gonna draw an image that looks very similar to this. You have some kind of chemicals and labware. Uh, you've got, they got a lab coat on. They probably should have goggles on if they don't in their picture. Uh, long pants, shoes, and yes, usually a man and a white man at that. And so uh, this is the misconception that only these people are really, should be interested in doing science, or these are the only people that can be good at science. And so we need to break that down and, and tear that misconception down for kids early. And so to me, this is what successful science actually looks like. These are scientists. Okay, so number eight of nine is science and technology impact each other, but they are not the same thing. And so in the article, uh, you, you've read that technology is sometimes created to solve problems to improve the quality of life. For example, the creation of the wheel or even uh, iCloud storage for how you could save all of your, your files at, with, you know, without taking up space in real life uh, with a disk or something. You know, it's a more compact way to store your files and more of them. Uh, vaccines are another uh, type of technology that's being created right now, right, to improve our quality of life. And so these things are considered technology and not necessarily uh, the acquisition of scientific knowledge, which is what science is termed as. And so they're defined as two very different things, and people oftentimes mix them up because they are also interrelated with one another. And so uh, Whenever we try to solve problems using technology, we call that an applied science. Whereas pure science is, like I mentioned, the attempt to gain knowledge for the sake of just having knowledge about the world. And so sometimes pure science leads to making technology on accident. So one example that McComas gives in his article was uh, lasers. And so it wasn't until later that uh, people started figuring out all the things that lasers could actually do to improve the quality of life for people. Okay, and then technology can also aid in performing pure science. And so, for example, uh, microscopes and telescopes all help us bend uh, light rays and manipulate rays of light so that we can take better observation, which is a science uh, process skill, right? That's, a, that's an act of acquiring knowledge using that technology. And so sometimes we will create technology to do science, but not always. So there's Galileo with uh, one of the very first telescopes. He's credited for creating the first telescope, which was a refracting telescope. And then, of course, 3D printers are a type of technology that uh, was created and is now being used to perform science. In fact, at this website, uh, you can actually view all of the different types of scientific research uh, articles that are out about how 3D printing 
uh, is being performed to try to uh, improve our quality of life, but also to actually just actually research that's being done. So here's a bioengineering 3D printing implant to seed multiple layers of tissue. And it goes along with our, our bio theme from the last uh, point. Buildings in the human bone may hold a key to stronger 3D printed lightweight structures. Shape-shifting structures take the form of a face. 3D printed artificial corneas. And so, uh, wow, what a, what a technology that's going to bring about new technologies for people, but also science is being performed with this technology to make those technologies possible. All right, and the last one, science and its methods cannot answer all questions. And this is super true. Uh, you gotta keep them on their limits to science. Some answers do not exist even whenever we uh, try to do the scientific method or do science methods on them. And why? Uh, because people have opinions. We'll never be able to answer, well, why, what, why is that your favorite color, right? Why, why do people have favorite colors? We won't ever really know the answer to that. There's no, no way to provide enough evidence to even get close to an explanation for that. Um, religion is, is another thing here, right? F to kind of validate that a God exists is outside the ability of science methods. We cannot perform any experiment or collect any observational evidence to, to really get enough evidence to claim any theories about religion. And so, uh, another thing that's addressed in the article that I think is important to understand and communicate with, with students, especially when they ask questions about it, is that science and religion are not at war. Um, we, people need to accept that science is not an attempt to discredit any religion uh, and that there no, no evidence exists through experimental procedures to validate or to uh, discredit the existence of any divine powers. And so, uh, science aims to provide the best possible scientific explanation of an observable phenomenon, something that we can observe happening uh, through patterns routinely over and over again. And so uh, this is an electron micrograph of bacteriophage. Uh, these are virus cells, right? And so uh, here is an observation of a virus infecting a bacteria cell. And so we could ask the question, where do why, why do viruses exist? Uh, even though we have an observable phenomenon, even it's, it's not, there's not enough uh, evidence to actually go back and track exactly why viruses exist on the earth. And so even scientific questions have limits to being answered. Okay, so that concludes class number one of day one. And so at this time, you can start working on your journal entry. And so I'm looking for a pretty good response. It doesn't need to be more than a couple paragraphs. Um, I mean, if you want to provide more than a couple paragraphs to answer your question, that's fine. But just fully uh, describe your answers in a response format to these two points on our Google Classroom assignment. So uh, first of all, make sure you are enrolled in the Google Classroom on, for STEM Inventory and that you have access to the journal assignment. And let me know if, if you're having issues with that. And then once you have access, uh, here are the two topics for journal entry number one. So the first one is pick one of the nature of science attributes or the NOS attributes and cite an example of when and how you taught one of them in a lesson. And it doesn't have to have been fully identified like maybe I did on some of the examples here uh, in this video, but maybe something that you were close to teaching and maybe didn't even realize that you were actually teaching the nature of science already. So uh, just give me an explanation there of what it was, how it happened or how you try to do it if it is something you do on purpose. And then number two is which attribute of the nature of science do you think would be the hardest to teach or do you think is the hardest to teach? And, and then explain why, right? So what, what makes that difficult uh, for you to teach?
And there's no right or wrong answer. This is a reflection for you. Uh, and so it could just be what's hardest for you to teach. All right, so uh, again, you can check out these references and uh, things whenever you are scanning back in the presentation of the course as well later. These are really good references. All right, uh, I'll see you guys next class.